Hi, this is David Shoemaker, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest installment of Living Thelema. Tonight's segment is going to focus on relationships in Thelema. I referenced this podcast a few podcasts ago when I was requesting feedback on relationships, and a few of you wrote in with some really good questions and experiences, and I'll be uh, weaving those comments in throughout tonight's segment. Now, my focus tonight is going to be on romantic relationships, but when you think about it, the way we would want to ideally handle a romantic relationship from the perspective of our Thelemic values uh, is not that different than we would want to handle any other kind of relationship. That is, we want to maintain uh, maximum mutual respect, uh, including respect for the other person's inherent divinity, the star that they are. Uh, we want to do our best to not interfere with their true will, as we might understand it. And we want to do our best to stand up for our own autonomy when or if that is threatened. And this is true of any relationship, but uh, a romantic relationship presents some other particular considerations, and we'll go into those in some detail. Now, a lot of what I'm going to say tonight, as you might expect, is informed by my own clinical practice in psychology. I do a significant amount of marital therapy in my work, but a few years ago, I encountered a book by an author named David Schnarch, that's S-C-H-N-A-R-C-H, and uh, his book is called Passionate Marriage. I'll put a link to that book on the podcast blog and on the livingthelema.com site. Um, but when I encountered Passionate Marriage, um, I was really impressed by his approach, and I felt that this was the book I'd been looking for uh, my whole career in terms of a book that could, in its own way, embody Thelemic values as they could be applied to relationships. So I encourage you to seek out this book and uh, see what you think. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say tonight is, as I said, drawn from my own experience, but I am uh, presenting a number of the ideas that David Schnarch gets at in his book as well. Now, it seems to me that one of the best ways to approach this material tonight is to look at a set of values that we could think of as Thelemic values applied to relationships. And as with all of these podcasts, I, I want everyone to understand that um, your mileage may vary, as they say, and that you know you should certainly feel free to experiment with these ideas and disregard them if you find them to not be in accord with your own will. Um, the first principle I want to put out there would be the concept of responsibility for self. I think if you if you think about the way that most of society treats relationships, it seems an awful lot of discussion is focused on the idea of making the other person happy. And I think this is where we really get off track. We get focused either on an obsession with making the other person happy, or we get obsessed with how the other person is doing at making us happy. As if the core of the relationship was what you're doing for each other as opposed to the other ways we're going to talk about it here tonight. So the first thing I want to put out there and perhaps challenge you with is to examine any assumptions you may have in, in a relationship that your job is to make the other person happy and vice versa. I am always telling patients, and, and this is really core in my opinion, that when problems arise, the first question we ask, that is problems, conflicts, uh, obstacles, so on, when these arise in a relationship, the very first question we should ask is not, why is the other person not doing the thing I want them to do? Why, why am I unhappy in this relationship and what can the other person do to make me happier? the first question we should ask is, what am I doing to make myself happy? If we are feeling lonely or unnurtured in a relationship, the first question should be, have I nurtured myself today? Have I taken responsibility for my own happiness today? If we're feeling um, like our own needs are not prioritized in the relationship, well, 
before we go hunting down the other person and insisting they do a better job of prioritizing what we need, we should ask ourselves about our own priorities. This, as you can probably see from the way I'm talking about this, this is a, an area that is really ripe for shadow projections. Um, those times when the unacknowledged parts of ourselves um, are projected out onto our partners and we we kind of scapegoat them as the reason for whatever problem it is rather than recognizing that it's an unacknowledged part of us that's creeping up and biting us at that moment. The second concept I want to put out there is that the basic unit in a relationship, contrary to what might seem obvious, is the individual. That relationships, ideally, exist for the growth and development of the individuals in them, and that it is through the growth and development of the individuals that the health of the relationship is maintained. This, again, kind of flies in the face of the way culture, mainstream culture, seems to think about relationships, and frankly, a way it flies in the face of the way that uh, a lot of contemporary marital therapy thinks of relationships, that that the relationship is the primary entity being worked on. I'm arguing that the individuals in the relationship are the primary entities being worked on. Now, it should be clear from the way I'm talking about this that the the will, the autonomy, the inherent responsibility of each individual in the relationship is of paramount importance. This doesn't mean that compromise doesn't occur. This doesn't mean that shared goals don't occur. And this certainly doesn't mean that the individuals in the relationship do not foster the furtherance of their partner's true will and all the harmony and happiness that can go with that. That would be awfully drab if relationships had none of that. What I'm getting at is that that's the natural result when two healthy individuals come into a relationship for the purpose of working on themselves and with the aim that their duty is to respect the other's work in the same regard. In this sense, a romantic relationship is simply one of many opportunities we have in society to unite with others in some configuration to further the good of ourselves, the good of each other, the good of the society, the community, the family, whatever unit of society you want to focus on. Now, the next concept I want to put out there is that problems should happen. And... The way I suggest you think about this is that if if you have a wound, it really draws your attention to the place that needs healing. Similarly, in a relationship when people bump up against each other, against each other's comfort zones, most specifically, a problem is created. There is a tension, a discomfort that is created by the very fact of being forced to stretch in some way, or challenged to stretch at least, the appropriate response is to allow ourselves to stretch, to recognize that because we have united our paths with someone, we are inevitably going to come up against places where uh, we we have an undeveloped part that needs to be explored, or we have a rigidity in some aspect of self that we're not wanting to unclench off of, um, something is being challenged by the presence of the other, and the appropriate response is to say, oh, this problem is showing me some way I need to grow in myself, And it, again, importantly, rather than saying this problem is due to something wrong with my partner that they need to change. If your primary focus is your own growth and your own learning, you are also supporting the growth and self-knowledge of your partner. 
Now, those are some global concepts that I wanted to get across today, but I want to turn my attention now to some specific situations, specific sorts of challenges that may occur in relationships. One of the emails I received uh, over the past few weeks related to this topic was from a correspondent who says, A friend and I have agreed to synchronize evening resh. It seems much more energetic and efficacious, though I also feel distracted by thoughts of my remote partner. I'll probably get used to it. I'm just wondering if you think synchronization with others at an early stage can be beneficial. Now, of course, in this specific instance, the the writer was not talking about a romantic relationship. But because in Thelema so many people are working with a romantic partner in their magical practice at one level or another, um, I thought this question certainly could be applied to that situation. So um, basically my response to this individual and, and what I would say in general is, as with many things, balance is the most important factor. If you only did ritual, let's take Libra Resh for an example. If you only did Libra Resh with a partner, either present in the room with you or, or theoretically uh, someone far away, um, you would lose some of the experience of doing that ritual solo. Likewise, if you never experimented with doing it with another individual, you might lose something of that experience. Um, any of you, there was a discussion online recently about this, any of you who have been in a room full of a whole bunch of Thelemites doing Libra Resh together can attest that while you lose some of the specific intensity of your own solo practice, there's something else entirely that is gained by experimenting with that as a group ritual and the, the fraternity, the uh, amplification of intensity due to all those wills being pointed at the singular goal. So as with any group ritual, you have the opportunity to, to amplify um, more than the sum of its parts, the, uh, the wills of those present. So keep a balance between doing these rituals individually and doing them with partners uh, near or far. Now, another category of problem that can arise in a thelemic romantic relationship is when each partner is at a different place in their magical work. For example, if they're both working in a particular order, but one is of a more advanced degree than the other, um, then they're very likely to have different practices, different reference materials, uh, perhaps different magical implements, certain rituals or meditations that can't be done openly in front of the partner. And this is an opportunity for issues of secrecy and trust and that sort of thing to emerge. If you feel yourself on the untrusting end of this sort of arrangement, in other words, you're the one who's feeling upset that your partner is off doing something and they can't tell you what it is or they can't do it in front of you. Um, as with the principles I've outlined in this podcast, I think your first question for yourself ought to be, what is this challenging in me? What insecurity is this making me confront? What am I afraid of losing? What am I afraid of not being able to share with my partner? What is this threatening in me? And if you do a thorough examination of those kinds of questions for several days or more, meditate on that, think hard on that, you may find that you come up with some important material for yourself. And by the time you've done that, you, you will find your worry about this whole situation has dissipated somewhat. If you're on the other side of this equation, you simply want to be as patient and compassionate with your, uh, with your partner as possible and explaining that, of course, what you're doing is not a lack of wanting to share with them. And there's probably, probably plenty of other things that you do share with them. But uh, this particular set of practices may not be among those things that you share for the time being. Now, this is an even more vibrant consideration in a relationship where one person is on the thelemic path and the other isn't, or perhaps um, one person is 
a thelemite practicing thelemite and the other person isn't even magically inclined. Um, here the issue becomes one of, first of all, most importantly, communication, where the partner who's not involved uh, has a clear understanding of the basic purposes of of the magical path to begin with. I had a, another correspondent who wrote in in the past few weeks who's in the situation where their partner is not at all magically inclined and not not unsupportive of them being on a spiritual path, but has taken um, it's taken quite a bit of time to help the partner understand some of the basic reasons for even doing these practices, to understand that it's not some crazy evil uh, thing, but uh, a, a path of self-development, spiritual development. And without good basic communication, there's no way any of this is going to be conveyed adequately. So if it breaks down at this level, it's likely to be much more of an issue of the underlying communication patterns and the ability of the couple to communicate on any sensitive issue than it is really about magical paths. Of course, there are times when you have a partner where you discover that your paths really are divergent and that can be a painful awakening. Um, it doesn't take long uh, being in the work before you encounter um, among your friends, among your fellow Thelemites, uh, some broken relationships, some examples where people in the process of getting in tune with their true will have discovered that their will has led them away from um, being able to harmoniously be partnered with a particular person. Um, this is equally true um, in terms of uh, occupations, um, alienation from family members, that sort of thing. And as I said, and as is obvious, when this happens, it's painful and confusing and uh, unsettling for everyone. But you have to hold on a second. And when you think that this is what is happening, when you think you have come up against a realization that, um, you know, my will is just carrying me away from my wife and, uh, you know, I, I can't continue my magical path and still be with her. She's hindering it. And, you know, if you get in that sort of mindset, you need to rewind to some of the principles that I was talking about earlier in this podcast. And before you conclude that uh, that you you simply must leave this relationship, I hope that you will stop and ask yourself how you are hindering your own progress, how you might be hindering your own progress, how you might be projecting your own obstacles, your own procrastination, or your own self-negativity, or your own... Um, your, your own lack of belief in what you're doing, whatever it is, whatever you think the other person is doing to block you or to, um, to hinder your progress, first stop and ask how you are doing that to yourself. And that's the essence of, of looking for projections in this sort of instance, um, which is extremely important and taking responsibility for your own, uh, your own growth, your own, self-knowledge as it can be applied to your path. Because believe me, if you don't do this and you preemptively end a relationship on these grounds without that self-examination, uh, there's a fair chance that you will end up regretting that. I don't have x-ray vision into your own inner souls, but, uh, I can tell you from watching lots of couples split for all kinds of reasons in and out of the Thelemic community, that this is probably, uh, one of the top two or three mistakes that people make. And that is projecting their own blockages onto their partner as the justifying reason for splitting. Now, to conclude today's segment, I'm going to read some selections from Alistair Crowley's essay called Duty, which, if any of you have uh, seen this, is uh, a wonderful 
examination of the different implications of the law of Thelema uh, in various aspects of human life, um, including relationships, including our responsibility to uh, the planet and to humanity as a whole. Um, so here's some selections that I thought were especially pertinent to our topic today. Your duty to other individual men and women to bring out saliently the differences between two points of view is useful to both in measuring the position of each in the whole. Combat stimulates the virile or creative energy and, like love, of which it is one form, excites the mind to an orgasm which enables it to transcend its rational dullness. Abstain from all interferences with other wills. The love and war in the previous injunctions are of the nature of sport, where one respects and learns from the opponent, but never interferes with him outside the actual game. To seek to dominate or influence another is to seek to deform or destroy him, and he is a necessary part of one's own universe, that is, of one's self. Seek, if you so will, to enlighten another when the need arises. This may be done always with the strict respect for the attitude of the good sportsman, when he is in distress through failure to understand himself clearly, especially when he specifically demands help, for his darkness may hinder one's perception of his perfection. Yet also his darkness may serve as a warning or excite one's interest. It is also lawful when his ignorance has led him to interfere with one's will. All interference is in any case dangerous, and demands the exercise of extreme skill and good judgment, fortified by experience. To influence another is to leave one's citadel unguarded, and the attempt commonly ends in losing one's own self-supremacy. Use men and women, therefore, with the absolute respect due to inviolable standards of measurement. Verify your own observations by comparison with similar judgments made by them and, studying the methods which determine their failure or success, acquire for yourself the wit and skill required to cope with your own problems. So on that note, I'll bring the segment to a close. I would really like to continue to get your feedback on the issue of relationships, and it's my hope that some of the concepts we were discussing in this segment will prompt you to think of perhaps challenges you've encountered in relationships and uh, let me know what those are. Ask your questions. Uh, I would love to do a part two of this segment uh, when the time is right, once I've accumulated some responses. As always, please visit livingthelema.com uh, for resources, uh, more information about me if you want to learn, and um, also the Living Thelema Facebook page. Uh, is there. I encourage you to become a fan of that so we can uh, communicate uh, in that forum as well. So thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking to you next time.